We are reluctant to evacu evacuate. Just think of all the people the storm has already killed. You and your family could be among these numbers if you don't take this seriously. There are no excuses. You need to leave. Evacuate, evacuate, evacuate. Governor Scott's equivalent of get off the beach. Georgia, South Carolina, and other states are on alert, and the White House is urging residents to take this deadly storm seriously. Both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump have expressed concern in statements and on Twitter for the people of Florida. The Sunshine State is, of course, a critical, critical election battleground. Ivanka Trump canceled the scheduled event there today, while the Clinton campaign closed offices in the state and suspended its TV ads running on local weather channel stations. Today, President Obama has declared a state of emergency in Florida. This afternoon, on a conference call with reporters, Clinton's campaign manager, Robbie Mook, suggested that Florida officials should push back the state's October 11th voter registration deadline because of the hurricane. You may recall that in the past two presidential election cycles, both have been disrupted in a fundamental way by monster storms. So, Mark, my question for you is, in what ways do you think Hurricane Matthew might affect the presidential race this year? Well, it's uncertainty, and presidential campaigns look for certainty. They hate stuff like this because they don't really know where the storm's going to go, how long it'll dominate the news, not just in Florida, but nationally, and what impact it'll have. I think there's there's two big things to look at. There's lots of parameters, but uh, lots of variables, but two big things. One is Governor Scott. He is Donald Trump's chief proponent in the state. For the short term, he's going to be incredibly busy. He's not going to be thinking much about politics. On the other hand, if he comes out of this having handled it well, if his popularity surges, Donald Trump's top surrogate could be mega popular in Florida for the duration. On the Democratic side, the Clinton campaign had a much better machine to try to deal with voter registration, early voting, absentee ballots. Does the bad weather make their strong machine stand out more, or does it spoil everything because people aren't concerned with voting and that hurts their chances? That we don't know. Right. Um, you know, just the, for, the, for, the, for the history lesson here, people remembering these last two cycles. In 2008, it was a storm that disrupted the Republican convention to some extent, but not later in the voting cycle. Obviously, in 2012, you had both a hurricane and that disrupted the Republican convention for the second time in a row in Tampa. And then we had, obviously, Hurricane Sandy, which had a huge impact on everything, partly because it was so close to New York and the media markets and so on. I think, you know, Governor Scott matters to some extent, but the second thing you talked about I think is more important. And it seems to me both sides, their get-out-the-vote operations, are going to be affected negatively by this impact. So it seems to me that the one that is better is going to be better place to deal with it just except because they're, they're better counting, and more dug they're in. They're counting on more votes that way. And they if the are. storm is sufficiently well, powerful that people are away from their homes, they can't find their ballots, it may be that yeah. the Clintons don't bank the advantage they thought because very few people will vote early under these circumstances. It depends on how disruptive the storm is and for how long. Um, yes. The, obviously, the question, all the questions relate to how long this thing goes on and how disruptive it is, especially in Florida, which is obviously going to be a super, super, super important yep. state. All right. The pressure course is now on Donald Trump to meet or exceed the expectations that have been set by his poor performance in the first debate and by Mike Pence's much pra praised performance from Tuesday night. Today, Trump's economic advisor, Steve Moore, and former Trump aide, Michael Caputo, were both quoted in a Wall Street Journal story saying that the Republican nominee needs to have a better night this Sunday in St. Louis than he did at Hofstra University. It's rare to see people saying that from Trump world on the record. It's a widely held sentiment, though, amongst expectation setters. Might get a sneak peek at how Trump is preparing and ready to perform for that debate for this evening when the billionaire test drives his town hall chops at a campaign event in Sandown, New Hampshire. So, John, obviously, if Hillary Clinton collapses in the debate somehow, that'll be a great night for Trump. But what would a W look like under these circumstances for Trump on Sunday night? Well, as you know, a lot of this depends on how we decide to treat it. We, you and me, and we, everyone in the media. I think we're just back to the same question we asked before the first debate. I, I think the standard has to be the same standard that it was before, which is we should expect Donald Trump to behave like a president and have command of issues, uh, have a decent comportment on stage, not uh, do many of the things that he did on Tuesday night in terms of how he uh, prosecutes his case and defends himself. I think the standard should be exactly the same as it was for the first debate. For him to win the debate, he needs to win the debate. Yep. On all those metrics, yep. substantive and yep. style. I think on style, it's clear, you know, no smirking, no negativity that's about personal attacks, right. talking less, more quietly, all of that. I think that they've, they've shown their hand a little bit on what they're going to try to do to win on substance, which is to talk about issues, to talk about things like taxes, energy, the Obama foreign policy record, where Trump thinks he holds all the high cards. Right. And I think that's that could be a win if he is able to effectively, depending on the moderator and the citizen questions, if he's effectively able to focus attention 
on those issues where Republicans think they've got the winning hand with voters. But again, I just really want to say, I have to say this, can't say that often enough. Donald Trump merely performing better than he performed disastrously in the first debate won't be is not enough. a win. That's not a enough. win. And, and yes, I mean, the obvious thing, if you were coaching him, you'd say, here's the starting point. You got to not get, cause problems for yourself. You got to not chase rabbits. You got to not take the bait over and over again. You got to try to actually be on offense, uh, be smart and crisp and clear and quick on defense to get out and do the pivots. All those things. That's the starting yeah. point, so not far, the point for victory. He's so far behind now in so many places where he needs to be ahead, including nationally that I think it, the bar is different for him in terms of what would constitute a win. In the first debate, I thought if he just behaved in a dignified manner and showed some grace and humor, he would have won. That's Not no longer anymore. enough. Not he anymore. needs to do all those things. Plus, I'll say again, he needs to force the, the fight onto terrain where Republicans think they have the upper hand with right. voters. And it starts, you know, again, Pence showed, the, showed their cards on this. It's taxes. Right. It's the Obama record, the right. parts of the Obama record that people don't like. And I believe it's, it's, it's the theme that he hit on for the first 20 minutes or so in the first debate. 30 years of dysfunction in Washington. Yes. We need an outsider. Yeah. And look, if he could perform... For, for 90 minutes, as well as he performed in the first 15 minutes of the first debate, he'd have a chance to win. Still he wouldn't, not good enough. wouldn't necessarily yeah. win, but he'd have a chance to win. Here's the thing that, again, to go back to, the whole point of these debates ultimately is to, to win the election, right? And the bottom line is right now, as it has been for all along, he's behind. And so if he doesn't gain votes on Sunday night or put himself in a position to win votes that he doesn't currently have, he loses the debate. And the election. And the election, importantly. Uh, after a spat with Alicia Machado, that former Miss Universe last week. Donald Trump's history of making boorish statements about women is one debate topic that is certain to be brought up on Sunday night by the moderators, the audience members, and or Hillary Clinton. But when Trump got a chance to try out a possible answer with a local NBC reporter in Nevada last night, <laughs> watch for yourself. You have two beautiful daughters who are past their teenage years that, you know, can be awkward and confusing. Do you understand the concern from parents of younger girls that some of the wording that you've used to talk about attractiveness or unattractiveness might make it more difficult for girls who are struggling with their body image and the pressure to sure. be model perfect? Sure, I do. And, you know, a lot of this is done in the entertainment business. I'm being interviewed for Apprentice long before I ever thought in terms of running for office. Right. A lot of that was done for the purpose of entertainment. And, you know, when people hear it and when they hear it, there's nobody, I can tell you this, there is nobody, nobody that has more respect for women than I do. Are you trying I to tone make, it down now? Well, not I, use I, those it's not a question words. of trying. It's very easy. But, you know, you're in the entertainment business. You're doing The Apprentice. You have one of the top shows on television. And you say things differently for a reason. Right. And now it's a much different world. But so, Mark, uh, a lot of people are somewhere between appalled, incredulous, and doubled over in laughter at that response. Is that really the best answer Donald Trump has to why he talks the way he talks about women? Not a great answer. It'd be a better answer if, after becoming a presidential candidate, he hadn't said a lot of things, including last week, that were offensive to people. So, I think, you know, he doesn't want to apologize. He doesn't want to say, I realize how offensive this was. I think the entire way he's handled uh, the insulting comments he made last week has been reflective not of being an entertainer, but of being someone who just does not want to behave in the way a lot of Americans think not just their president, but anyone running for president should behave. Or frankly, really any man should behave. Um, yeah. You know, look, you've got a situation here where basically if you listen to that answer, his answer is, I called women pigs, slobs, and dogs because for the purpose of entertainment. It's like actually making the situation worse. If that's the path he wants to go. I was in the entertainment industry. It was good for ratings. It was good because that was my persona. If that's really the path he wants to go down, it will make the situation worse for him rather than ameliorating it or remediating it in any way. Because there's no one that I know, again, I go back to Republican, Democrat, old, young, rich, poor. There's no woman I know who thinks that, that the stuff he says qualifies as entertaining. No, and, you know, Howard Stern says stuff like that. Yeah. And if Howard Stern ran for governor of New Jersey under the right circumstances, he might be able to win. Yeah. But president of the United States, it's a different thing. And this is the kind of thing that Trump says that if he had advisors around him who could influence him, presumably he wouldn't say. Again, he may not want to apologize, but there's nothing he could do for himself that would be better politically than if he were to actually apologize on Sunday night, apologize for those statements, and recognize, say he recognizes that it's offensive to more than half the country, and he wants to try to change. Honest to God, I don't think there's a single thing he could say that would do him more good.
All right, we're going to talk with a couple of reporters who are covering this race closely about how Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are prepping for the big Sunday night showdown in St. Louis. We'll do that when we come back right after this. Called in some backup from the nation's capital for this next block. With us now, Washington Post reporter Phil Rucker. He is in the Post newsroom and in our Washington, D.C. bureau. Bloomberg's own Margaret Talib, White House senior correspondent who covers the Clinton campaign. Thank you both for joining us. Margaret, uh, how's the Clinton campaign and Hillary Clinton herself, as best you know and can tell, approaching Sunday night's debate? So uh, several of us talked to Robbie Mook of the Clinton campaign earlier today, and uh, one thing that he emphasized is that they do believe that Donald Trump is going to come better prepared uh, to this next debate than he did to the last. It's kind of a low bar to, you know, not surprising they think he would surpass that. Um, they're also predicting, at least for public consumption, that they don't think that he is going to go to the personal attacks, presumably on Bill Clinton's past of infidelities, et cetera, that Trump sort of flirted with the idea of at the tail end of the last debate. Um, they're saying they don't expect him to do that. I'd be shocked if she isn't preparing for that anyhow, just in case. But for her, the real challenge is the different format. Of course, it's a town hall format. And uh, she's really strong when it comes to kind of you know, I was going to say man-to-man -man combat, one-on-one -on -one combat in the kind of traditional debate style. That venue where she's emotionally connecting with uh, random strangers she's never met is maybe a little tougher for her and something she's going to be working on in the next few days. Phil, uh, flip the question around on the Republican side. Donald Trump um, clearly going to be doing more prep than he did last time. Is he doing anything like what a normal presidential candidate would do in the face of a town hall debate in terms of the mock debate, building the set, stocking it with, yeah. uh, with fake questionnaires, et cetera? So, uh, so yes and no. Uh, uh, he's refused to do a mock debate. He feels like that that kind of rehearsal, that's preparing scripted answers, is not for him. However, he's doing a dress rehearsal tonight in New Hampshire. He's got a public event there, a town hall meeting. Uh, I believe he's going to be there with New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who's been helping take the lead on preparing him uh, for this town hall debate. And it'll be a chance for him to work on uh, how to interact with voters, on body language issues, on sort of how 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 to to build a connection with people when they're asking him a question uh, and also, of course, to talk about some of his answers. One of the things he's trying to work on uh, better this time than the first debate is taking advantage of opportunities uh, to hit Hillary Clinton. So, for example, if cybersecurity comes up, 
talk about our emails uh, and so forth. So we'll see if it works. So I want to switch the storm. Uh, storms like wars tend to be more TV stories than print stories, but I'm sure the Washington Post newsroom has turned its attention here. Uh, Trump needs a lot of attention on this debate. He needs to not only do well, but he needs a lot of people to watch it. What's your sense that your newsroom and, and news in general from Thursday to Sunday of how much focus they'll be on politics as opposed to the storm? Well, I think right now we're, we're really looking at the storm and politics is taking a back seat, although Sunday is, is three days away from now. Uh, so we'll have to see. I think a lot, of, a lot will depend on what the impact of the devastation is uh, in Florida, in Georgia. Uh, we'll see a lot of millions of people are being evacuated. So uh, clearly it's a big story. It'll be an even bigger story uh, if there are casualties. Yeah, well, I mean, of course, our hopes and thoughts are with all the people in Florida and in the path That's of right. the storm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a huge storm and one where public officials are doing their best to try to prepare, but the devastation, uh, some things just can't be controlled by human beings. Margaret, just look at the politics of it, though. You know, we talked about it a little bit earlier in the show. You got two battleground states in Florida and North Carolina that both could be affected in a significant way by this storm. Just talk about the ways in which you think it could impact uh, the, the efforts to, to the ground game, efforts to do early vote, efforts to rally the base in both parties, et cetera. Absolutely. One thing that Robbie Mook did say earlier today is that uh, they're expecting as many as 40 percent of the votes altogether could be cast before Election Day. And the three states that he really emphasized were Florida, North Carolina and Nevada in terms of states that could be cited before Election Day. Two of those states, of course, are directly in the path of the storm. And so that becomes a very important proposition for the Clinton campaign. We saw with the controversy over them going, you know, halfway done placing an ad with the Weather Channel and then pulling it back, that they obviously are concerned about not not being seen as politicizing uh, the storm and, and not distracting from public safety issues. But it's it's going to certainly affect um, kind of the, the continuity of, of turnout efforts, door knocking efforts, that sort of thing that the infrastructure of the campaign has built in. They're saying they're communicating directly with their volunteers and staff in those states saying, listen, your first priority is, is to heed uh, the, you know, instructions about evacuation and that sort of thing. The, the intensity of that storm, what actually happens and how it affects people will matter on a couple of fronts. Number one, and obviously, there are weeks between now and Election Day, but can people get home to vote? Will they be concentrating on voting? Um, but, you know, uh, another issue is the public response, both of a Republican governor in a Republican state and of the Democratic president who remains so popular. If minority areas are disproportionately dis, you know, affected by the storm, is that going to reflect in voting uh, in African-American areas and Hispanic areas, both in terms of turnout and in terms of um, belief in what a Democratic administration could do versus a Republican administration? And then finally, once the storm passes, certainly it would make sense to expect visits from both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump in which the storm plays a role. Will they visit affected sites and that sort of thing? How they do in that very real and delicate setting may matter also. So the storm will have a huge impact potentially in a couple of these really important states. Phil, as, as we head towards Sunday night, um, the first debate usually has the, the highest audience. Do you get the sense that you, between the storm and the fact that it's the second debate that there's football on Sunday? that people are going to be tuned into this one and anything like the numbers of the first one? I, I can't imagine it's going to reach the numbers of the first one, but uh, I, I also think it'll probably reach more people than the vice presidential debate, uh, which had fairly low viewership a couple nights ago. So, you know, somewhere in between. But as important as watch as people watching the debate, as people tuning in in the, you know, 48, 72 hours that follow to the media narrative and to the coverage and, and seeing some of the clips online and, and just getting a sense of how Trump performed, whether he improved, whether he scored some points against Hillary or not. Yeah. Uh, so We'll be watching Sunday. To that, to that end, I'm wondering if either of you have any reporting on this. The, the Clinton campaign, following recent history and what Phil said, recognized it being super aggressive on social media, surrogates, press releases to spin, uh, seem to outdo the Trump campaign, at least to some extent. Any idea if the Trump campaign, the RNC, are gearing up to try to be more competitive on winning the debate after the debate? I, I assume they're trying, although one thing uh, that's striking about the Trump campaign, as prolific as Donald Trump is on Twitter, his advisors really are not yeah. uh, that active on Twitter. It's not like the Clinton campaign where there's an army of operatives and strategists who are constantly uh, trying to drive a social media conversation. You don't see that on the Trump side.
Yeah, the Trump campaign, I, may, I don't know if they don't realize it or not executing, but the Clinton campaign knows reporters, political reporters, are heavily influenced by following Twitter uh, in the immediate after, during the debates and the immediate aftermath. And that's whether it matters as much as, as reporters think or not, it's certainly one uh, wh place where the Clinton campaign is, outdoes the Trump campaign. That's exactly right. Yeah. I, yeah. Margaret, last question I have for you is Bill Clinton. Uh, he came to the first debate, first time he's come to and been in the hall for Hillary Clinton. Do we expect him, do you know, in St. Louis? And uh, is it less likely, given he's stirred up a little controversy this week with his Affordable Care Act comments? Yeah, and also, uh, he was so good in this, uh, in, in his town hall debate formats, you know, you wouldn't want to see the memory of him upstage the memory of her. But in that first debate, it actually really went down to the wire whether or not he would be in the room or watching from a hotel room. And that decision to put him out there uh, really was made sort of in the last minute. So I think it's anything's possible. It's sort of a game day call on their part. At least it was the first time around. Right. I'd like to see him there. Just dresses the place up. Who, who doesn't? Who doesn't like to see <laughs> the President yeah. Clinton in the hall? I really want well, to make the handshake, the handshake with Melania. Yes. Yeah, the was handshake. Good. <laughs> yeah. All right, that Margaret and Phil. Priceless. Yeah. Thank you both for joining us. Appreciate it. We're going to talk about how Clinton v. Trump and their big showdown might affect the down ballot races in this contest when we come back. There is reporting in the New York Times today about a renewed Republican sense of anxiety over Donald Trump's recent dip in an array of national and battleground state polls. The story suggests that another poor debate performance by the GOP nominee on Sunday could trigger mass panic among Republican down ballot candidates, causing them to break ranks and run from their nominee's cause post haste. Mark, um, if Trump has a disastrous night in St. Louis, I have three questions for you. They're all conjoined. How quickly would the GOP freak out happen? What would it look like? And what would its implications be? Well, they wouldn't freak out just because of a bad date performance. They'd freak out if the bad debate performance led to a further deterioration in the polls. As the Times story correctly reports, a lot of Republican-oriented groups and campaigns have very bad numbers for Trump, worse in some ways than the public data yeah. nationally in the battleground states. You know, if you if you distance yourself from Trump and you handle it badly, Trump lashes out. The press will write endless numbers of stories about the distancing. You tend you could create a position where Trump does even worse and drags you down further. So they have to distance themselves if it comes to that in a in an artful and delicate way. But I think uh, it would be 
it would be a very, very tough thing for the Republicans to do. But if Trump is basically down eight points nationally after this debate, I think you'll see a ton of it. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the debate, him, the, how he loses the debate, if he lost the debate, how he loses matters a lot. If he lost narrowly, if he lost on substance, if he lost in kind of a respectable way, the, I don't think the polls would collapse, and I don't think you'd see the freak out. If he has another performance like he had in the first debate, where he not only fails on stage, but then spends a week doing things that make the cause even worse, I think the freak out will be instantaneous, and people will run willy nilly away from him. Some will do it more artfully, some will do it less. We obviously see Republican Senate candidates all over the country, ones who are doing well, who've done well by providing an example of how to artfully yeah. distance yourself from Trump. They've been doing it all cycle. Yeah. Rob Portman's been keeping his distance from yes. Trump. So there's, there's models for how to do it. If, yeah. If you look at the national polls and the state polls. If you have you got a contest where it's like Clinton 44, Trump 41, right? Just yeah. as like a generic notion. And then you got Gary Johnson, you got Jill Stein, you got some undecideds. If if it ends up being like after this debate, a basically a 49-41 race or 47-41, 48-41, 48-40, then these candidates are going to see the Trump floor is, is a danger. Yeah, it's 1996 all over again. And for people who don't remember, yeah. there was a moment where it was explicit in 1996 when people realized the Bob Dole was cooked and the race was over. You were two or three weeks out, two and a half weeks out. People basically, the Republican Party basically got up and said, all clear, everyone just abandoned right. Bob Dole and figure out how the best way for you to do it right. is, but get away but from the that. the difference between Bob Dole in 96 and George Herbert Walker Bush in, in 90, yeah. in the midterms, when they, they, they were distancing from him, is, is Dole and Bush, former National Party chairs, they got the joke. Yeah. They knew that you couldn't lash right. back. Trump will, I presume, lash back. All right, when we come back, former campaign manager for Ted Cruz. That's Jeff Rowe. He will join us along with Democratic strategist Steve McMahon. Love those guys. But first, these potent words from our sponsors. Welcome back. If we had countdown clocks, we'd have a countdown clock up now because there's just days left before the next presidential debate. Joining us now from Houston, Texas, Jeff Rowe, former presidential campaign manager for Ted Cruz, and from the City of Angels, Democratic strategist Steve McMahon, the co-founder of Purple Strategies. Gentlemen, welcome. We haven't talked to either of you in a while, so Jeff, start with you. What is the state of the presidential race as you see it? Uh, Trump's down a bit, and I think it's setting up a Super Bowl of sorts for Sunday to realign the race. It's important because of the storm, because of the other news, because of the waning days, because of early votes 
starting to come in, particularly in the key states in the next few weeks. It's critical to reset the narrative. If you remember going into the first debate, Trump was on, had momentum. He was on a tear. He was putting even states that were seemingly out of reach in play. And that changed on Sunday night. And so it slid back. It more, it more kind of resembles how it looked before we went into the conventions. And so now I think Sunday, it makes Sunday very critical. But for, to be clear, there are some outlier polls that show some Trump hanging tough nationally, but most of the numbers seem to have a margin of victory advantage for, for the Clinton campaign. Steve, Trump put himself in the current hole based on a bad debate performance. Can he dig out of it completely or mostly with a good one? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's a really good question. I think structurally this race has always been about a three or four point advantage to the Democrat, and that could have been Hillary Clinton or whoever else was nominated just because of the electoral college and the partisanship in the country. But what you've started to see in the last week is, you know, as Trump has become Trump again, um, he's begun to slide backward. And you look at these battleground states and, you know, the states that he looked like he might have a chance to win. Uh, a couple weeks ago, he now looks like he, he's falling behind in states like Colorado and New Hampshire and some of the others that uh, Nevada that that he really desperately needs to win. Even in Ohio, there was a poll yesterday that showed Hillary Clinton ahead for the first time in some time. So, you know, he's he's uh, he's losing ground in Florida and Virginia in the states that he must have. He's losing ground in states that Republicans have never been successful unless they've won, like Ohio. And uh, and I think it's getting very, very late in the game for him to turn it around. And I think being desperate and angry and lashing out is exactly the wrong strategy for him. But it's, I predict what we'll see on Sunday night. Steve, just think about the, the town hall format. And we have talked about this around the office a lot. It's not obvious that either one of them is better, you know, demonstrably better in this, in this setting. Who do you think, if you think about, you know, Trump's more of a showman, she's got more experience debating, who does the format favor? Well, I actually, this won't surprise you because I'm a Democrat, but I actually believe that Hillary Clinton is probably more natural in those kind of forms because they're much more like the way Democrats have to campaign for president and the way Democrats campaign if they run for the Senate, for instance. Donald Trump, remember, throughout this campaign has mostly been big rallies, standing behind a podium, you know, screaming insults at people, and he's not walking around the crowd interacting with real voters. So I think for Hillary, it's a much more natural setting. Donald Trump's a showman, so he's obviously going to be a good performer. But I think for her, it doesn't take a performance. It's just kind of who she is and how she's campaigned. Jeff, you, you were, when you were running Ted Cruz's campaign, you spent a lot of time watching your guy on a debate stage with Donald Trump. Make the case for why Steve's wrong and why this is a better, more favorable setting for Donald Trump. Well, I would actually agree with him. So, but this, this is why I think <laughs> is the reason is because Donald's Fine. got a fifty-foot flag Go behind him. Disagree with 25, the premise of my right? question. Thanks a lot, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty-five thousand people stay. But this is why I would say this is why I believe Steve's got it wrong, is that he has an opportunity to showcase a, a part of himself that he's never done before, and that sets the expectations. If you see this guy who's you know, red-faced and yelling and getting people whipped up and 25,000 people, the 50-foot flag and a big, you know, presidential look. But then you see in his advertising, even of late, where he's kissing a child on the cheek at the end of one of the commercials. I mean, this is an opportunity. I believe he walks in structurally in a disadvantage from the way he's campaigned versus the way Hillary has campaigned. But, but as an opportunity, I think the sky is the limit, therefore, for Donald. If he comes out and is emotive, connects, shares... Right. Shares his heart, as Mike Pence would say. That's a real opportunity, and we've not seen, and that could be an opportunity for so him. So he should avoid kicking any babies out of that room on Sunday night, right? Probably so, if, at least for one night. Right. Yeah. You guys Are you do... sure he didn't bite that baby? <laughs> no biting. <laughs> you guys, I've done a lot, a lot of races, and, and I want to ask you about one that's gotten a, t a, a ton of attention, but I don't think enough, which is Rob Portman versus Ted Strickland, Ohio Senate. Jeff, uh, what lessons are there for the other candidates running this year, if any, with Portman running way ahead of Trump in Ohio and putting away a race that people thought would be close. You know, there's this like an incumbent dilemma that they have when when they have a candidate that's that's announced and running against them. How long do you take? Do you ignore them and, and just kind of oh, act, act like nothing's going on in your race? Everything's fine versus when do you engage them? And it's a dilemma that goes on in every campaign. What the Portman campaign did well and what incumbents routinely do poorly is engage immediately. They accepted that they're in a tough race. They accepted they're in a presidential swing state in a in a battleground <laughs> year and they went after it early 
and, and often. And I think that's one of the lessons. It's always, the, as an incumbent, you want to have this invincibility. You don't want to show credibility to your opponent. It's tougher than I'm saying that it is, but it's really a difficult decision to actually take a race seriously, show that, you, that you're worried and you could be defeated, and engage a campaign structurally from the very beginning. He did that and was a master at it. It didn't hurt that he had a a poor challenger, but he put he put this this race away. And can you believe we're talking about the DSCC pulling out of critical battleground states right. that they should always be in at this point in the race? Steve, I want to ask you a question today. We got some news from the publishing world. Donald Trump's paperback is out. Uh, previously, it was known as the, in the hardcover version of it was called Crippled America: How to Make America right. Great Again. The new version is called Great Again: How to Fix Our Crippled America. Um, what do you take from that? You think that was a well-handled uh, piece of, uh, of a shift, a little switcheroo? And what should we, what's the lesson of the fact that he's decided to go that way? Here's what I take from it. Kellyanne Conway is firmly in control. Um, somebody must have explained to Donald Trump that, that negative, angry, vitriolic people don't get elected president of the United States. The, the American people typically, and whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, they tend to, to, to be drawn to somebody who's offering a positive, aspirational vision for the future that takes America to a better place where we all benefit, where we all work together, where we all kind of strive together. You can see it, frankly, in Hillary's um, slogan, Stronger Together. That sort of is an embodiment of this idea. So I think Donald Trump finally figured out that the election's about the future, and it's about a better future, and that's what people want. Right. And that's even, even his most ardent supporters um, desperately want a better America, and I think he probably made that little switch in time for the paperback so he could sell more copies and perhaps position himself a little better yep. to actually be that yep. kind of a leader. Do we have right. those book covers? Do we yes. have that book cover? They, they were up. They were up. Oh, we showed them already. I like the best thing about it is the look of different faces. Yeah. That's the best part about it. This Steve McMahon, podcast. Jeff Ryan, there it is. gentlemen, thank you so much. There, there it is. Book covers. Coming up, we'll talk <laughs> more about Donald Trump's town hall in New Hampshire tonight and how Hillary Clinton's preparing for Sunday's debate. If you're watching us in Washington, D.C., you can listen to the program every day on the radio, Radio Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back. This hour, uh, the North Carolina Governor McCrory has ordered a state of emergency for all counties ahead of Hurricane Matthew. So that's a little bit of storm news. Uh, we also have some 
other news, which is that Donald Trump is up in New Hampshire getting ready for the town hall meeting that we've talked about a couple times tonight. That event will undoubtedly be scrutinized for clues as to how he's preparing for the second presidential debate this Sunday. With us now to talk about that and more is NBC correspondent Kelly O'Donnell, who is out in the Granite State covering Trump and back here in our studio. Once again, the great MSNBC political correspondent Casey Hunt, who just can't stay away from us, enough. apparently. Can't stay away. Kelly, why Sandown? Well, John, in part, this is a Republican area, so that will bring about a friendly crowd, a crowd that will ask questions. Is the expectation with Howie Carr, the uh, conservative Boston radio host, as the moderator? That's part of it. The other part of it is that Governor Chris Christie held his very first town hall of his presidential run at this very same place just hours after he jumped into the race back in 2015. So he's already done the the run through here, and he will be joining Donald. Trump tonight. So this is familiar turf. Uh, there were already the relationships in the community. Invitation only, which we have seen has bristled some uh, of the feelings in the area, but there'll be about 150 guests, and this will be a real-time see it for yourself dress rehearsal for Sunday night. This is the kind of debate prep that Trump advisors say uh, that the candidate wants to do where he's taking some questions where he can try some things out where he gets a little bit more experience with this format. Now they say he loves this format uh, but I think we all know from watching him the big rally is his most energized most uh, sort of in the zone place for Donald Trump to be. So this will be good practice. I'm told he's also got some other time set aside between now and Sunday to do more work. Uh, but it's interesting to see a candidate who is pretty candid about the fact that we're getting to see the debate prep instead of it being, you know, holed up in a hotel, working with uh, advisors, that kind of thing. So it'll be interesting to watch. In politics as in life, uh, people like the predictable and at the same time, you don't worry about what you can't control. Yeah. How is the Clinton campaign dealing with the storm as you see it? Uh, well, I mean, Robbie Mook was on the phone today with, with reporters talking about uh, both their early voter registration efforts and the storm a little bit. He said that they hope that they extend the voter registration deadline in Florida. Which is Tuesday uh, as of now. As of now. And then, of course, they're dealing with this small flap over their ads that were placed on the Weather Channel, which they now say they are asking to have those delayed until the storm passes. I think that, look, this is a real, you know, and I don't think we want to get too much into that. I know you guys talked about it a little bit at the beginning of the show, but too much into the politics of it before we understand, you know, the ramifications for the people of the state. But I think that clearly, depending on the impact, the ramifications were so close to Election Day, it could really impact, uh, you know, in a state that was, the, you know, one of the most closely decided uh, in 2012, expected to be closely this time. Anything could really happen if, if the damage is actually what's none, being None created. of us know, but John and I debated at the beginning of the show. Does their superior ground game mean that in the tougher terrain of trying to get the people to turn out early and absentee in a storm, the tough, the, they're, they'll thrive in the tougher terrain? Or is their advantage wiped out because in the tougher terrain with people moved all around, distracted by the storm, it mitigates their advantage? I mean, look, I think one of the greatest challenges for the Clinton campaign here is the unpredictability of the Trump side. To a certain extent, they don't know what they're running against. So anything that makes this more unpredictable, I think, is going to up the level of stress right. for the Clinton campaign. And I think this is yet another thing that makes Florida more unpredictable and difficult to grapple with. I do think they believe that uh, the Trump campaign, if they have a ground game anywhere, they have a ground game in Florida. Right. So to a certain extent, they, they feel like they might be a little bit better matched. They have sent some, some more staff down there in recent days, now dealing with trying to rehouse them, actually, um, in light of the storm. But I, I don't think it necessarily helps them. Kelly, let me ask you about Florida and Trump. I mean, this is a, a, his adopted second home, um, he, the place where he spends a lot of time, a place where he also owns an incredibly opulent resort, Mar-a-Lago, um, which is actually on the beachfront. Um, what kind of challenges does this potentially pose to Trump in terms of how he talks about it and how are the people in the Trump campaign preparing for that and thinking about it? Well, it's complex for that very reason, because he has a business in the eye of the storm. We don't typically see that. So far, we've seen the more traditional response with the tweet where he's wishing people well and urging people to be safe, a more lengthy statement. Uh, but in talking to advisors, they're saying, we just don't know what we're dealing with yet in terms of how this will affect the campaign, the public events, and so forth. But for Donald Trump, there's a very real ongoing impact with the property he owns, the employees he has, and 
And that is something that can, on the one hand, give him a, a more vested stake in talking about Florida, which he does refer to frequently as a second home, but it really puts him in the middle of that. But it also means that he will be judged for how he handles it as a boss, as a person who is big in the community. Are they taking all the right steps? Are they following all the rules? And are they working in conjunction with Governor Rick Scott, who has been, of course, supportive of Trump? So it puts Donald Trump in a situation where we have not seen him very often, and that is a true national emergency where he's got to make judgments not only as a candidate, but as someone who has a real invested interest in the state where this is going to be felt. And so that's a new way for us to assess how Donald Trump handles an emergency. Does he have the right tone? Does he do the right things? Does he set an example? Uh, that's part of what will be interesting over the next 48 hours. Of course, separate from all the real human life aspects of it, the political calculation is something he's going to have to tread carefully. And advisors I'm talking to say they're just not entirely sure how best to handle it yet because we don't know the scope of what will happen. So the, Clinton, so the Clinton campaign is going to be watching Donald Trump up here in New Hampshire tonight. They're going to be watching very carefully, I'm sure. Do you have a sense of whether they think that, what, what they think of this as a way of preparing for a debate? Not the way in which uh, Ron Klain and Karen Dunn would ever have someone prepare for a debate, go into friendly territory, do a public event. They do it in a much more structured and rigorous way. How do they feel? Well, they look at this and say what? Look, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. She has been doing town hall events as well, which she doesn't always right. always do. I mean, look, I think to a certain extent there is value in, in putting a candidate uh, in, in the physical space that they're going to be in. And the only way you can really do that in, in a real way is to do what he's doing here in New Hampshire. But of course, that well, said... Trump, yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I was going to say, in Trump's case, it's the only way to get him to do it at all because he won't yes. do a fake, a fake <laughs> yes. rehearsal. So That's actually exactly what I was going to say. Like, she's going to do the, the actual town hall, and then she's also going to spend two Two days, uh, you know, mocking this up. They haven't done uh, mock debates yet, but that's our understanding for what they're doing over the course of, you know, later today, tomorrow, Saturday, uh, with, of course, uh, Philippe Rhinus playing Trump again. You know, I, I think the question still. Is Trump going to be willing to do, as you say, the prep that, uh, you know, at least his advisors think he needs to? All right. Uh, Casey Hunt in this chair. Basically, we need to have a third chair for Casey now all the time. Happy to <laughs> I'll see move you. In. That's fine. Uh, Kelly O, come back, please, soon and, and try to kick Casey out of will the do. chair. Thank you for being here. You two, you're great. Up next, we will talk with one of Florida's top political strategists about the hurricane and more right after this.
eyes tonight on Florida and the approach of Hurricane Matthew. President Obama had phone calls today with the governors of Florida and then the states next up the coast, Georgia, South Carolina and North Carolina. This is a storm that, of course, could have a lot of implications for the general election, including in the mega battleground state of Florida, the election 33 days away. In person, early voting in Florida starts on October 24th. Some absentee ballots have already been mailed out. Joining us now is someone who knows all of this quite well, a former assistant secretary of state, longtime Republican strategist, and one of the smartest people we know about Florida and other stuff. Rich Hefley, thank you for joining us, man. Good to see you. So Florida, as we were talking about during the break, basically tons of people vote absentee, tons vote early, tons vote on Election Day, three separate ways of voting. Talk about how the storm is going to impact early voting, absentee ballot voting, and Election Day. Well, as you said, essentially we have three elections. Back in the 88 election, only 11 percent of the vote happened before Election Day. Now it's a majority of the vote happens before Election Day. And it's time shifted around a little bit. You have the absentees that went out uh, overseas, went out last week. In-state started going out Tuesday. We're supposed to finish tomorrow. And then uh, early voting, as you mentioned, starts the 24th. So uh, that has changed and time shifted. It used to be Republicans had a great advantage in winning the absentee ballot. Ballots. Now the Democrats have caught up, and that's basically even early voting. Everyone thought when that happened, that was going to be a big advantage to the Democrats, and that's essentially gr drawn even. And then on Election Day, that's really w still, even though it's less than a majority of the vote, is key because in the last, in, in the gubernatorial elections, the Republicans have won on Election Day, and in the presidentials, they've lost, and we've won gubernatorial elections and lost the presidentials. Right. So President Obama won Florida both times. Yes. He ran 2008, 2012. What's changed to the extent anything has changed that makes Florida more hospitable for Donald Trump than it, than it was for the past two Republican nominees? Well, I think uh, you had a lot more uh, voters vote in the presidential preference primary on the Republican side. I think there's an intensity. I think the growth has been re relatively even um, partisan wise. We've actually uh, gained in registration since the last presidential election. We being Republicans. We being the Republicans. We've never been in the majority, mind you. But um, in a closed registration state, but it has gotten better. So uh, I think between the intensity, uh, registration, uh, and the political environment, you've got uh, all Republican statewide elected officials, with the exception of Bill Nelson for U.S. Senate. They're doing a good job right now. You're watching Rick Scott do an extraordinary job with this hurricane. He did a great one with the last hurricane and did a great job with the pulse. So they're seeing Republican management in action. And Rick Scott, in many ways, is a, is a Trump model. If, uh, if Rick Scott, if, as we all hope and pray, the storm does not cause a lot of devastation, if Rick Scott continues to be as aggressive as he was today in handling it, is he a potent political force in the state? If he's more popular and energized for Trump, does that make a difference? Absolutely. Well, realize there only have been two Republican governors reelected. Uh, that's how new we are to controlling the state as a, an old Democrat southern state. Jeb but Bush, and, Jeb Rick Bush Scott. and Rick Scott are the only two that ever been reelected. So um, he is a potent political force. Uh, he is the governor. He has all the tools of the governor's mansion and has really uh, now catching stride. I mean, if you watched him in the pulse, if you've watched him with these hurricanes, his business background and his leadership have come to the fore and have benefited the citizens of Florida. Clinton's campaign manager today said he wanted to have the governor, the state, extend the deadline to register to vote past Tuesday. Is that something Republicans are likely to go for? I wouldn't think so, but I mean, I find it the the hurricane just came about the last couple days. I mean, it'll be litigated. We'll go to court. It's Florida. Okay, we can. I'll, I'll cede that part. But the fact of the matter is, is that this was coming up. If they weren't prepared for this, and now they're saying four days out, we need to extend it because this storm is hitting South Florida. I think that's you know kind of thin soup. But again, we want everybody to have their right to vote if that's what it takes. Okay. Rich, thanks for coming in, man. Okay. Thank welcome, you. Welcome to New York City. We'll be right back.
Hi, this is Ted Cruz calling. Uh, I was calling to encourage you to come out and vote on election day. Uh, this election is critical for the direction of our country, and I urge you to come out and, and support freedom, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Uh, you can vote by absentee ballot, and if you need help getting an application for an absentee ballot, the Republican Party of Texas can help you with that. Or you can vote in person. Uh, I just wanted to encourage you to come out and vote. Thank you, and God bless you. Fired up and ready to go. That was Ted Cruz working at an RNC phone bank in Fort Worth, Texas. The video was posted on Twitter today by a Dallas News photographer. Cruz did not mention his former rival Donald Trump on the calls, but it still didn't seem like he was really loving it. Do you remember once upon a time on this show we talked about having our own custom emojis and one of them we were going to make was the sad octopus? That's the sad octopus right there. Tread Ted Cruz as sad octopus. Maybe just like the weeping he was pacing octopus. himself. Pacing himself. <laughs> Man, that does look like fun. Coming up on Bloomberg Technology, Emily Chang sits down with Xiaomi VP of Global Operations, Hugo Barra, and Sling TV CEO, Roger Lynch, wow, two you. mega titans of the tech world. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Sayonara. I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of your first word news. Hurricane Matthew is taking aim at the U.S. East Coast. After battering the Bahamas, state officials quickly declared emergencies in Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. More than two million residents have been warned to evacuate. After reaching areas that were cut off by the storm, Haitian officials have dramatically increased the number of fatalities. 108 people are now confirmed dead. The previous number was 23. Three. Russia has issued a warning to the U.S. against attacking forces allied with the Syrian government. It's the latest sign of escalating tensions between Moscow and Washington. The Kremlin says strikes targeting government-controlled territories are a direct threat against Russians deployed in the area. By consensus vote, the United Nations Security Council today formally nominated Antonio Guterres to be the next Secretary General. Guterres spent 10 years as UN High Commissioner for Refugees. He says he wants to serve the most vulnerable. The victims of conflict, of terrorism, the victims of the violation of rights, the victims of poverty and the injustices of this world. The 193-member General Assembly is expected to approve Guterres' nomination next week. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts around the world. Bloomberg Technology is next.
Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, social media star Snapchat may be getting ready for the public markets. We'll bring you up to speed on what we know so far. Plus, does anyone want to buy Twitter? Shares fall more than 20% on reports that prospects for a deal are falling apart. And a rare interview with Cheng Wei, the founder and CEO of China's Didi Chuxing, how he won a turf war and took over Uber in Asia's biggest market. But first, to our lead. The flashiest tech IPO in more than a year is officially in the works as Snapchat prepares the paperwork to go public. According to people familiar with the matter, the company is aiming to sell shares in the first quarter of next year, possibly as early as March. But the timing is tricky and sources cite three key factors that Snapchat's parent company, Snap, is watching. Joining me now from New York, our Bloomberg Business Week reporter Max Chafkin with the latest. Max, you did a very in-depth feature on Snapchat. What do we know about their plans for an IPO? How soon? What we know is a uh, rough valuation. They're seeking $25 billion, which if, you know, a lot of people in Silicon Valley have been worried that there's some sort of, uh, the, the air is being taken out of the bubble. I mean, that'll give give a lot of confidence because it's a big improvement uh, over their last valuation. Um, the other thing is they're, they're trying to do this quickly. Um, it's pretty stunning when you think about just how fast Snapchat's moving. They only added, you know, these basic measuring features that most of their competitors have, you know, like in the, in the past weeks and months, and they just announced this glass glasses thing. I mean, they just changed their name to, to Snap Inc., which uh, I think I just made a mistake there. But but in any case, it's it's <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty wild just how fast this story has moved, and this IPO is just sort of like the latest thing in what's been kind of a crazy six months. So why do you think they're going forward with this now? I mean, I know there are a number of factors out there that they've said will affect their timing. Right. Well, I think so. So part of it, I think, is they're trying to seize on some momentum. Um, Instagram just uh, Facebook's Instagram just knocked off the basic functionality of Snapchat. I think a lot of I think there 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 must be concern about that. And and you sort of want to like seize the moment right now. It's 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 been really good. And and the other thing is again, Snapchat's kind of unproven. So so there may be a thought that like we may as well you know, get public now rather than sort of risk some problem in the private markets. If, if private funding were to dry, dry up in the, you know, coming, you know, 12 months or 18 months, that could be a real problem for Snapchat if it weren't public. So I think it could be sort of a combination of seizing the moment, but also just, um, you know, trying to time the market. Now, I spoke with Twitter investor Chris Saka earlier this week, and the first thing he did when he saw me is Snap, uh, not, not use Twitter, uh, which he's been Twitter's uh, biggest cheerleader for the longest time. Uh, take a listen to what he had to say about Snapchat. Snapchat is interesting in that what I think distinguishes it is less about the product and more about the product team. That's a company that's been willing and able to reinvent itself a few times now. They're just bold. They just take chances. And when they originally walked up to me after a talk I gave once and said, we really love what you stand for. We love the way you work. We talk to other people who work with you. We want you in our deal. And I was like, uh, they walked away. And I went home and I told my, the, my younger business partner. And he's like, you said what? <laughs> and by the time we got back to Snapchat, they'd run away and done a deal with somebody else. It was a bummer. It probably cost us a few billion dollars. So unfortunately for Saka, he didn't get in on that deal, but others did. You know, he's, he's using the uh, product innovation, the willingness to change as a positive, perhaps in comparison to Twitter, which, you know, hasn't changed. How are we, how is, how, what do we know about the actual numbers here in terms of users and user growth and the actual market that Snapchat has been able to bite off? Uh, you know, I, I don't have the, the, the numbers handy. I think we're talking about about 150 um, million daily actives, which is a, which is a big number. I, I, I'm not sure, Twitter has been sort of squirrely about its daily users um, in the past, but, but I think most people believe that Snapchat is seeing, you know, much better engagement than Twitter. And when you consider that the way that Snapchat has grown and how, how young it is, like, that's pretty impressive. Um, the other thing about Snapchat right now is it's just cool. And I think one of the things that we've learned, you know, from watching the evolution of these social networks um, over the past decade is, is that sort of thing matters. And, and Twitter really um, seems to be struggling just, just to retain users, to get people excited about it, whereas Snapchat, as, as uh, Chris Saka is saying, I mean, they are just bringing out new products, new ideas, sort of these, right. these new shows constantly. And, and there's a, you know, I mean, there's a real sense of momentum. Well, we'll see if cool is enough to uh, spark public market investors. Our Bloomberg Business Week reporter, Max Chafkin, thanks so much uh, for that update. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation tomorrow with Lightspeed venture partner, Ravi Maitre. Lightspeed was the very first venture capital firm to back Snapchat. 
Turning now to Tech M&A, because on one hand, Qualcomm is moving.